Welcome everyone to day one of the International Workshop on HIV and Transgender People 2020. Uh, in fact, this is the second international workshop, not the first. We had uh, a meeting last year in Mexico City in conjunction of the International Aid Society uh, Conference. And as I said last year on opening it, and I'm opening it again here on behalf of our college education, this meeting uh, arose from my realization, I, I was at a, at a conference, at an International Aid Society conference, and together with other people, we realized that uh, we, although we had been working with HIV for 30 or more years, I had never ever had any interaction with uh, transgender men. And after I realized that, I went to uh, the, person, the place where we physicians study, which is called PubMed, where you look at the, the medical literature, and I realized there's, there was nothing, nothing medical on transgender men. And then I looked and on, on conferences and I realized most conferences on transgender people, they refer to transgender women. And I said, that's not right. We need to do something about that. We need to be inclusive and be inclusive inclu means including all transgender people. That includes transgender men. And more than that, I think we as physicians, as HIV physicians, in an area in which HIV is a chronic uh, situation, each our patients are going to live forever. We're going to live as long as, in fact, they're going to live longer than I am because I'm uh, than I want to live because I'm not that young anymore. So we need to know all of their health issues, all of everything that pertains to their lives, health-wise and um, socialized everything. So uh, because of that. I talked to, to Charles Boucher, who's uh, from biology education, to Alice, and I said, we need to do something about that. And that's the history, that's how we got here today. And so with this opening, that's me, that's Mauro Schechter. I should have introduced myself beforehand. I'm uh, Mauro Schechter from uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And as I said, I'm here opening on behalf of a virology education. This meeting was made possible thanks to the generous support of Viv Healthcare and of Gilead. Without them, we'd not be able to conduct this meeting. Also, without our endorsers, we'd not be able to do it. And as you can see, we have several of them. They're listed here on the slide. I'm not gonna read their names, but I'll give you time to read their names and they are really essential for the success of this meeting. Uh, if you need a certificate of attendance, that will be provided to you. But first you need to complete in that, please ask you to do it, complete a short survey after each session that allow us to know how well we did or how badly we did and how can we improve for next uh, year. And uh, at the end of uh, the meeting, after the, the meeting ends, you will receive through email an extensive survey. And please complete it, it's really important for us. And after, uh, uh, after completion, completion of that survey, we'll send you via email a certificate of attendance. If there are questions, you have to click uh, the live Q&A field and type your questions or, question, or questions. Uh, we'll do our best to, que to answer these questions by the speakers during the Q and A after the end, at the end of each uh, session. As much as we can, we can try and we we'll try and re respond to all of them. We also have a, a session called "Meet the Experts." These are thirty-minute informal discussion with the speakers immediately after each session. These are Zoom-based uh, sessions which allow you to be hear, heard and seen. So these are sessions in which your face will be seen. If you want to have a question, if you want to make a comment, if you want to share your experience, that's your opportunity to be heard and to be seen. So use this opportunity so all of us can learn for each, from each other. All of us can share our experiences. So please use this opportunity. It's important for all of us. And then, Without further ado, I'll pass uh, uh, the microphone to Joanne, who's also uh, say her opening uh, words. Joanne?
Good morning, everyone. My name is Joanne Keatley. I'm the chair of the board of the Innovative Response Globally for Trans Women and HIV. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this exciting two-day workshop on transgender people and HIV. Um, this is a partnership with Virology Education and IRGT and many other partners that have come together to provide you with exciting and current information on the state of transgender people um, and HIV globally. Um, and what we have put together, we hope will be of interest for you and will help you in engaging uh, with our community as you go about doing your work and will contribute to greater knowledge and awareness of our community, um, which I think is you know, really critical when you're working with us to have the latest information. Um, we wanted to make sure and just give a shout out to all of the organizing committee that has worked so hard on putting the sessions together for you. Um, and of course, our presenters, who are all fabulous experts in their own right uh, and have uh, you know, contributed generously with their own time and effort to come together to provide this uh, opportunity for, um, for uh, you and for people who are interested in the state of health among transgender people. Um, and we also wanted to pause and just um, you know, reflect on how different uh, the state of health among transgender people uh, is currently. Um, the last time that we had the opportunity to come together, uh, you know, virology education and uh, trans uh, community experts who had all come together to uh, deliver the first virology education, trans people and HIV session in Mexico City uh, was uh, a short and I would say almost a lifetime ago uh, in July of 2019. Um, and uh, in the 18 months, almost 18 months that have um, you know, taken place since then, there's been a lot of changes in our world. We are now in the middle of a pandemic that is devastating our community and others. Um, and we're dealing with uh, really two epidemics that have had disproportionate impact on our community. Um, and so we have a lot of work ahead of us and we feel that um, you know, with uh, this information that we're sharing uh, today and tomorrow that we hope uh, it will make it uh, just a little easier uh, for you all to provide the excellent services that we know that you can for our community. Um, so, um, you know, with the spirit of really um, moving ahead and uh, trying to address the uh, challenges and the, um, the impact that the epidemics are having on our community, um, we really want to welcome you to the next couple of days. Uh, we know that you will find the presenters engaging and interesting and uh, the content re relevant for your work. Um, and we look forward to uh, your engagement in the chat sessions after uh, each of the talks. Um, we have, you know, everything from current epidemiology to the impact on sex working communities within our trans community, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on trans communities globally, um, you know, the, uh, the approaches for providing um, medically affirming and gender affirming care uh, for trans uh, people of all 
genders, including you know, trans men, trans women, non-binary folks, etc. cetera. Um, and really uh, wanting to provide you with content that will address the issues and the needs of our entire community. So with that, um, I think that um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, our first uh, chair person who will lead off with session one, which is uh, looking at the uh, epidemiology and trans populations. So thank you and look forward to hearing your comments later. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. It's a pleasure um, to be with you um, from the morning where I am in Philadelphia in the US for this first session, looking at the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on transgender communities globally. We have a wonderful group of speakers joining us from Germany, India, and the United States to talk about how the pandemic has impacted um, health, healthcare access, and well-being for trans communities. Um, just as a bit of overview, we'll have each of the speakers um, uh, present their talks. We will then have a, a roundtable discussion with those speakers. So you'll be able to submit your questions um, in, using the chat function, and we encourage you to. And then we'll um, ask those questions before moving on to the second part of this morning that will be an overview of um, HIV um, epidemiology in trans communities, um, followed by an additional Q&A session and then a meet the expert session um, this morning um, later on or um, in your time zone, whatever time that is. Um, I'll remind you of that as we go along. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who is um, Will Beckham. Dr. Beckham's research focuses on socio-structural influences on health and social and behavioral interventions. He uses implementation science approaches to ensure evidence-based interventions reach populations most in need. His research is on sexual and reproductive health, including prevention and treatment of HIV, especially among sex workers, men who have sex with men, transgender populations, and other sexual and gender minorities. Um, and Dr. Beckham, Dr. Beckham is based um, at Johns Hopkins University um, in the US. Um, Dr. Beckham, take it away. Hello, I'm Will Beckham. I'm a researcher at Johns Hopkins University in the School of Public Health. And today I'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on transgender communities globally. We know that trans people face heightened vulnerabilities, greater stigma and discrimination, and significant minority stress that lead to a lot of health disparities. And these disparities would only be exacerbated by emergencies, including this pandemic. We hypothesized that the pandemic would have impact, especially on socioeconomic conditions, and would lead to loss of employment and income, loss of health insurance, especially in places like the US where health insurance is tied to employment, disruptions in safely conducting sex work and other gig economy work, um, and homelessness. And very particular to trans people, we hypothesize that there'll be um, disruptions in gender affirming care and access to resources, as well as worse mental health care access and outcomes. And of course, it, many trans people have higher rates of HIV AIDS and disruptions to prevention and treatment, PrEP and ART are um, probable. So we conducted a survey through LGBTQ dating apps that have a global reach, Hornet and Her. In round one, which was the spring and summer of 2020, we had over 24,000 respondents. Uh, and about a thousand of those we were able to analyze as trans and gender diverse respondents. Two thirds of them identified as non-binary or third gender or some other gender, not men or women. Um, about 30% were identified as trans feminine, trans women who were assigned male birth. And a very small portion were trans masculine or assigned female or intersex at birth. And now live as men. Uh, we have one preprint in MedRx uh, from this and another paper as well that's um, in peer review. I'll be talking about some of the results from that. And round two is ongoing now. We have over 14,000 respondents at this time, and we plan to do some trans-specific analysis on that as well. So this first round of the survey had respondents from 76 countries, most of them in Europe and Asia. 50% screen positive for depression, 46% screen positive for anxiety, 
reported an expected loss in health insurance and 77% expected an income loss. And we found there were reductions in access to gender affirming resources. 55% of the sample said that they had these reductions in access and this could include anything such as services, including healthcare or therapy, but also things that are important for one's gender expression and um, identity such as haircuts or hair removal and supplies such as hormones, binders, wigs, packers, breast forms, anything else that one needs to be able to live in their gender. And then we also saw reductions in the ability to live in one's gender, the amount of time when one was able to do that, um, about 30%, 38% reported um, having reduced time to live in their gender, for example, if they had to move home to live with parents who were not supportive or did not know that they are trans. And we did find an association, a statistically significant association between these predictors and the outcomes of higher prevalence of depressive and anxiety symptoms, as well as suicidal ideation. So there, though it's cross-sectional, there is a link there that definitely needs some attention. And of course, this was a multi-institution, multidisciplinary coalition, the COVID Disparities Working Group from a lot of institutions, organizations, as well as the private sector. And I want to acknowledge all of them and thank all my collaborators and co-authors on this as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckham, for that talk. Um, you may have noticed that this was a brief talk. We've asked the presenters to give brief talks in the hopes that there will be more time uh, for discussion and engagement. So please do be thinking of questions and entering them um, into the chat so we can pose them uh, to the speakers um, in the Q&A session. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Shaman Gupta. Shaman is the co-chair of Tweet Foundation, Transgender Welfare, Equity, and Empowerment Trust and has been working for trans rights in India for more than four years. He has worked with thousands of young trans men and women to provide them with health, legal, and employment support. He's also worked with closely with the Ministry of Social Justice to launch a skill building program for trans men and started a shelter home for trans men in Delhi. He's been awarded the Dalai Lama Fellowship for his work with the community and works in the education sector um, in his day job. Welcome, uh, Shaman. Hi, my name is Shaman. I'll be taking a perspective from India today on how COVID-19 impacted the trans community. A little bit about myself. Let me give you a quick context about the trans community in India. The trans women or the trans feminine community as across the world has largely been secluded in India as well. They live in the outskirts and are largely dependent on rituals which they perform on celebrations, weddings, parties where they get arms from people. They're also largely dependent on daily sex work and begging. The trans men community on the other hand is also largely secluded. They're highly invisibilized, they live in silos and live with families sometimes as well as are dependent on daily wage income. The COVID-19 pandemic brought on a lot of challenges for the community. We will be discussing some of it right now. The first one being lack of any kind of financial saving. As the trans community is dependent on day-to-day -day earnings, they didn't really save anything for a rainy day. And when COVID-19 struck, they didn't have anything to depend on. The second challenge was due to lack of proper identity cards that trans community in India has. Most of them, since they run away from their homes, do not have their identity cards with them. Or sometimes they have an identity card with their dead name. And hence, when the government came forward with some of their initiatives, they were not able to avail some of them because they really didn't have any identity proof. The third challenge was not having even bank accounts because they didn't have any identity cards. They were not able to open any kind of bank accounts and not receive income or donations from either NGOs or even individuals. The fourth challenge came when the lockdown was implemented. The trans community members who were staying at home faced a lot of harassment and violence from their fam family members for being for not being able to express their gender identity. They didn't find a safe space at home. 
another harassment and violence came from landowners or house owners when the trans community was not able to pay rent a lot of the facilities that was provided by the government and ngos were in the form of groceries but the rent required direct cash transactions and hence the trans community faced a lot of harassment from the house owners as well another difficulty that the trans community faced was in terms of their jobs a community which is highly stigmatized and ostracized in their workplaces was an easy target for the layoffs and new jobs were even more difficult the last and the most important aspect of the trans community in covid-19 was lack of any healthcare facilities provided for the trans community itself the lack of trans friendly doctors in the covid-19 wards the covid-19 wards itself being divided into male and female segments and no affirmative services for the trans community in the lockdown was one of the most serious concerns support came in many ways but some of the response system that came from government also lack the understanding of the issues that the trans community faces and hence mostly went to waste the community was largely dependent on the services being provided by the non profits and the ngos or the philanthropic institutions the corporates also largely failed to come fr- forward and support the community because of large funds being diverted to the national pm fund and hence the trans community got highly deprioritized and didn't really kind of get the support that they should have being one of the most vulnerable and ostracized community in india thank you so much for that talk shaman um and th- We now have the opportunity to hear a bit about some global research on the impacts of um of COVID-19 on trans populations hearing about the specific situation in India which as people know is one of the countries that's been most affected um by by COVID-19 um and now finally our third talk um is going to focus on um uh access to healthcare in in the context of um of COVID-19 and that's by Andreas Koller um who is a research fellow at the interdisciplinary transgender healthcare center in Hamburg Germany and an MD candidate at the University Medical Center Hamburg Eppendorf he received his uh, BSc and MSc in psychology he's currently doing his PhD on the subject of decentralized delivery of trans healthcare and his MD on individual treatment requests of trans people seeking medical interventions welcome andreas Um hi there I'm going to present data from our transcare covid-19 study um it was a global survey uh, assessing the effects of covid-19 on transgender and transgender health um at first thanks to all who took part in our survey and all the community groups supporting our research you can see them right uh, on the lower part of this sheet My name is Andreas Köhler. I receive a PhD scholarship by the Klaus and Simon Foundation Hamburg and otherwise I do not have any other disclosures to make. So a few quick words concerning methodology of our study. Um the Transcare COVID-19 study was a web-based survey we developed in cooperation with 23 community organizations and was translated into 27 languages. Um um uh, it was open to everyone uh, who was transgender and was at least uh, 16 years of age and we recruited via uh lgbti related social media channels and or other lgbti related channels and snowball sampling um the study received ethics approval from both the ethics committees at the university medical center in hamburg and from the ghent university hospital There was no funding for the study and data collection started in May 2020 and is still ongoing. So um take a look at our website maybe took part take part in our survey or forward is to forward the survey to everyone who think might be eligible for participation. Um we assess demographical data, physical mental health problems, behavioral risk factors 
data on COVID and how COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic influenced the access to transgender healthcare services. Um, by August 9th, so this was uh, the date of the last analysis of the whole sample, uh, 5,267 transgender people from 63 higher middle income and high income countries participated in our study. Um, I will only present to you data from these higher income countries as the data from lower income countries aren't analyzed so far and recruitment in those countries appears to be difficult. So if anyone in the audience wants to support recruitment in, uh, in, in the country still missing, feel free to contact me. Um, so what did we find? Uh, we found that over 50% uh, of our participants had risk factors for a severe course of a COVID-19 infection. And this was about 20% higher compared to the general population of most OSCE countries. Um, moreover, we found that our participants were at high risk to avoid testing and treatment of a potential COVID-19 infection, and this was due to their fear of mistreatment or discrimination as a trans person by healthcare providers. And finally, um, <clears throat> we found that uh, over 50% of, of those participants who already had accessed um, transgender healthcare services uh, experienced restrictions to those services. So amongst others, the access to hormones was restricted for uh, more than 20% of our participants, nearly 35% of surgeries were canceled or expected to be canceled and 50% of those who recently had uh, uh, access to um, um, surgery had restrictions in terms of aftercare, surgical aftercare, for example, regarding um, wound healing problems. Um, moreover, more 40% of our participants um, experienced uh, restrictions regarding counseling services and even low threshold services like uh, support groups were access to those was restricted for more than two thirds um, of our participants. And with all that risks and restrictions in mind, um, we found that more than one third of our participants had suicidal thoughts since the beginning of the pandemic and 3.2% have attempted suicide since the beginning of COVID-19. So what are the key messages of our survey, of our study? Um, we found that transgender people might suffer under the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic even more than the general population. And this was due to their status as a vulnerable social group because of their high amount of risk factors and their need for ongoing medical treatment. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic can potentiate these risk factors, um, can add new challenges for trans people and can let um, to devastating mental or physical health consequences uh, for the transgender population. So I want to thank you for your interest. Um, again, we are very grateful to all who supported our research and took part in our survey. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or remarks. Thank you so much. I want to thank each of our uh, wonderful speakers for, for their presentations. Um, they've raised a lot of the um, issues that are facing trans communities in, in the context of the pandemic in terms of their, their own risks for COVID-19, um, the social and economic impacts of the pandemic and impacts on access to care. Um, now have some questions that have been raised um, by participants in the workshop, as well as some questions that um, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask. Um, so I'll start with a question from the audience that I think um, was for, um, for Will's presentation um, around, uh, the question was, um, how come there were no trans organizations participating in the research? But I might ask more broadly, can you talk about how um, trans um, people or organizations were involved in the study or not? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I was actually pulled on to this research late. Um, I don't know exactly how everything was formed, but the, the Hornet app was used mainly to um, survey. The target was really men who have sex with men. And um, that, those are the main users of the app. And then the organizers realizing they had a lot of trans feminine people on there as well using the app. 
they wanted to be sure to ask some questions of trans people. I was pulled on after the data was collected. Um, that said, they're trying to correct such things and make sure trans people are involved in trans organizations. They're very open to collaboration. So if there are organizations out there that want to collaborate as we go through in the future, um, feel free to reach out to me and let's, let's you know, right these wrongs and make sure we're doing this right. Thanks. And I also may take the opportunity to ask um, Andreas to also talk a little bit about how trans organizations have been involved um, in, in your project. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, uh, several of the researchers in our project are trans people. So, and also we involved all the community organizations you've seen on the slides um, in both construction and, and implementation of our studies. So we basically designed the first draft and then put it put it around with with all to all the um, organizations got feedback and yeah worked it up then um, to yeah basically that's it and yeah, yeah. Thank you. One thing I wanted to ask each of you, um, we obviously, there's a lot of um, challenges facing trans communities in the context of the pandemic. Um, but I also was wondering if you can reflect on anything that you think is going well um, in the context you're working in, whether that's innovations that are being um, tried out to increase access to care or community responses, um, any kind of glimmer of hope that we might learn from um, for, for work in our own settings. Well, maybe um, from our experiences here in Germany and in Europe, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, it was pretty hard, but now there are a lot of like this web-based opportunities for trans people to uh, get access to access care. And this is something, it, it took a little time to implement all these structures also for, for the providers. Most of them never had used things like Zoom or something like that, but uh, now it really it works really good. So I think this is something that um, uh, yeah, that's, that's for, for uh, important for future, for example, also to to serve r uh, rural communities or something like that. I I could add that in my experience of the trans community here, where I live in Baltimore. Um, and I think this is common across trans communities of very much um, community resilience and community care of people helping each other on a grassroots level. Um, and we also saw that in the survey of, um, we asked questions about feelings of hope and feelings of being able to get through. And there was quite a lot of um, hope and um, resilience um, seen among the, the survey participants as well. And, um, you know, it's really heartening to see like here in Baltimore, we have an organization for trans people run by black trans women. And they, throughout the pandemic, have continued to provide food, access to hormones, access to prep, um, you know, without a, without a day where they completely closed down, they just moved outside and did what they have to do to uh, help people on the ground. And that's really wonderful to see. Yeah, I think I'll also add on to what Andreas and Will shared, right? Uh, especially for what Andrea said, I think that's uh, really, really relevant for a country like India, where online services were almost nil. Uh, and the way that has come up now, both in healthcare as well as uh, education itself uh, and employment, uh, is where uh, you know I feel that that's the only uh, good part of uh, you know this overall lockdown and COVID period. This kind of accelerated us uh, uh, probably five years ahead. Uh, in terms of technology being used by healthcare professionals and trans people able to accessing those uh, online healthcare services, be it uh, uh, you know uh, psychological interventions or any kind of mental health care, uh, as well as uh, uh, even the education part, right? Uh, the amount of online uh, education, be it degrees or schooling, has that has come out now. People, uh, trans people who are really not comfortable or dysphoric. They don't have to kind of uh, while they're transitioning or while they're not comfortable uh, they don't have to uh, go into spaces which are not comfortable for them great thank you 
And while we've been chatting, a few more questions have also come in um, from the, from the um, participants. So I'm gonna share those as well. The first question is, is there any specific information on um, presumably how the pandemic is impacting migrant or ethnic minority trans people in uh, the US or Europe in particular? Well, from our survey, we ask for minority status in terms of uh, if, if, uh, in terms of race so, and religious minority, and our sample consisted of um, nearly eleven percent people of color and seventeen percent uh, people uh, from religious minorities, and we found that this was not a uh, not a factor that. Um, uh, in terms of how hard COVID hit those communities in particular. So basically we found even uh, people from minority groups uh, are hidden uh, as hard as, as, as non-minority trans people. We also have questions about um, ethnicity, race, and I believe immigration status. So immigration status may be um, only on the second round, it's still being collected, uh, but it's definitely something we're interested in. And of course we can unfortunately hypothesize that it's going to hit them harder. So that is something we didn't do that analysis in this paper I talked about, but that is that is information we have and more papers will be continuing to come out on this data as well. Thanks, and another question that came in also about the research um, that I think that you could both speak to as well was, um, noting that there were um, only a few countries in Africa that had participated in um, the, the, trans, uh, the trans care survey. But I was wondering if both of you could speak about whether or not there are um, uh, participants for um, the number of participants or the number of countries from the African continent represented in your studies and um, ways that um, that can be um, addressed since data collection is ongoing for both. Well, as I already said, uh, the data I presented were from these uh, higher income countries. We collected data in Africa. Uh, we worked together with the gender dynamics group from South, Af South Africa, and we covered about 15 countries from Africa. And we're, uh, we're honored to analyze this data. Actually, it was pretty hard. It is still pretty hard to collect data in Africa because there are not that not structures like in, in in the U.S. or in Europe, like support groups or organizations. Um, so it's pretty hard to reach trans people in in Africa to participate in our survey. Most of them that participate in our survey were from. Uh, uh, the, the southern region and north, uh, the northwestern region of Africa. And yeah, actually, we, we were thinking about how we could uh, deal with that and find other ways to, to um, recruit uh, people in, in Africa. But yeah, I don't know, maybe Will has an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's difficult. The limitation of the survey I talked about is that it was mainly through this dating app, um, Hornet, and it just happens to have bigger market shares in certain countries and not in others. So, for example, it does not have a big market share in um, the US or most of Africa. There were some, um, and we have that in supplementary material um, by regions, what numbers we have, but it is it is limited and I think we need to Think through very targeted strategies and working through what local local organizations there are such as gender dynamics um and if you know going through a dating app we have to figure out which ones are more popular um in africa um in various parts of africa and think very specifically about strategies how to recruit um but uh, given the stigma and discrimination those are especially in most of sub-saharan africa it's going to be very difficult but I think it's possible with targeted strategies. Thanks. Um, and a few more comments and questions have also come in. So in the interest of time, I'll share a few of them and then give you a chance to uh, to respond. So first, just a comment. I think this is in relation to what you said, Will, that it was really encouraging to hear about the grassroots work being done by Black trans women in Baltimore. So thanks for, um, for sharing that. And then two questions, the first of which was um, whether, how or whether, um, 
intersectionality was factored into the research designs of the um, of the two studies that were being discussed, and also um, whether any research has been done in Latin America uh, where the pandemic has particularly affected uh, trans um, uh, communities. Uh, an example was shared about how Mexico City trans sex workers um, were put out in the streets by the government as they closed down the hotels they lived and worked out of um, related to um, the health precautions. I mean, I think we've seen similar examples of um, perhaps in other settings as well of how um, restrictions or government actions are um, particularly impacting trans people and sex workers. So um, comments are welcome on, on uh, both of those questions. Uh, regarding intersectionality on ours, um, I think Aiden may be placed to answer that one on the round two survey. Um, we wanted to add some intersectional stigma um, questions. So on the round two, such questions are being asked, um, such as, um, you know, have, have you experienced discrimination based because of who you are, I think is how we um, phrase the questions. Aiden could correct me. Um, and with this one, we do have, Hornet has some good um, market share in Brazil. So there's a fair number of, of the participants are from Brazil. Um, off the top of my head, I would have to, I would have to look again, but there is some coverage in Latin America and certainly we need to be considering. Um, there are questions also about how it affected their sex work um, and other access to income. Um, and as well as like shutdowns and how those affected them. But off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to say how it impacted Latin American uh, trans people differently than others. Well, we actually, we tried to find some uh, cooperation partners in Latin America, but weren't that lucky. So it's also like a blank spot in our study. We are, as our study is ongoing, we are always searching for folks to purchase, uh, to, to collaborate, um, maybe someone in the audience, but actually we haven't covered uh, Latin America in our study. Thanks. Um, another question just came in, so I'm going to um, uh, share that as well. And again, take the moderator's uh, prerogative to expand on it a bit. So the question is, did the surveys ask participants about diagnosis of COVID-19 and access to care for treatment that may have been necessary? It seems to be uh, pivotal because many government agencies would not be collecting this information. Um, to also think about it a bit beyond research, I'd also invite you, um, all three of you, to comment on how um, uh, people um, people who do need um, uh, diagnosis or care, um, how they're experiencing the system when they seek that care. Are they able um, to access it, or or what barriers are they facing, whether from your research or from your um, from your knowledge of what's happening in your community? Well maybe some words on the COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, we asked our participants and we found that about 1% was uh, COVID positive in the last four weeks and another 0.5% recovered, which is no, low number compared to, to, to the, the, the whole sample. But we found that as already said in my in my presentation, that about seven percent um, avoided testing because of fear of mistreatment, avoided COVID nineteen testing, and about and fifteen percent will will avoid testing in the future if there might if there there might be a COVID nineteen infection. So um, because because of the fear of discrimination and mistreatment. Um, yeah. Maybe that's what I can add to this. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, we didn't have that on ours, on the round one. So then, when you spoke, you had mentioned um, sort of issues around, for example, um, COVID wards being gender segregated and how that impacts folks. I'm wondering what you've heard or seen in terms of how people are or are not able to get um, testing or care um, for, for COVID-19 in particular? Yeah, 
so uh, considering the population of india itself the uh, you know it has been chaotic in all all kind of healthcare systems have been extremely stretched um, and adding to that the unawareness of most of these wards as well as even uh, you know uh, the uh, wards that were created for just isolation um, in in different parts of the country while you were entering a city or exiting a city, city right uh, those are also not uh, properly uh, meant like or at least were not uh, transgender friendly right people were kind of segregated either into the male wards or female wards and most of the doctors in india not being too well aware of the kind of uh, health conditions that a trans person can have due to uh, taking their hormones or suggesting you know when to stop their hormones when they, they took covid they got covid infected uh, were the key challenges a few cases that have heard were um you know the, the doctors didn't really understand how the hormones may impact the medications of the covid uh, uh, 19 uh, infection that were being given uh, were were the largest you know um, uh, a little bit of a bummer uh, coming from the doctors themselves uh, so that that was one thing and of course the access itself um, uh, which was not present online the first two three months uh, people went through a huge mental trauma staying at their homes and not being able to talk to any kind of counselor uh, for a first few month on this um, and and even the go- indian government kind of uh, started a helpline um, you know saying that okay trans people and specifically for trans people saying you can call them uh, but even their doctors were you know not uh, ready to give um, uh, information that, that that was really probably hormones or any kind of transition stuff because they hadn't dealt with trans people prior to uh, these kind of online helplines so that that was the overall scenario and it's still going on and uh, probably just uh, want to uh, you know kind of invite people and if, if any kind of uh, data can be collected from india as well about the impact right now we're seriously facing a lack of any kind of data to convince the government on the kind of uh, support that they should be offering to trans people at this point in time uh, and any kind of studies there you know where we can contribute uh, would be happy to connect uh, people to uh, the indian population Thanks, Shaman. And I'm just going to add for everyone a, um, a programming note that because there are still lots of questions and comments coming in, we're actually going to um, keep this uh, discussion going until the top of the hour. So that's 11 a.m. Eastern. I'm sorry, I don't have the time zone conversion memorized, but it's the uh, another 12 minutes uh, before we uh, turn to, to the next talk. So with that programming note, I'll go on to another comment that was um, put in the chat that um, I think relates to um, to the, the conversation around engaging community organizations in research, particularly um, in Africa. Um, uh, so I just want to I'll read the comment out um, uh, from Barbara Leon. Hello, Barbara. Um, there are there are many trans organizations in Africa. We have the competency, the capacity, and expertise to do research. There are regional bodies such as the Southern Africa Trans Forum, the Eastern Africa Trans Health and Advocacy Network. Uh, the West Africa Trans Forum and Northern Africa Trans Network. There's also the nascent but growing African Trans Network. Um, all these bodies are doing good work. Um, and as example, points to um, the East Africa Trans Health and Advocacy Network, Ethan, which has um, publications at ethan.org uh, slash um, publications. Um, so I think that's helpful information for those who are um, currently um, conducting research or planning research and want to ensure that um, that African trans experiences are represented um, and community groups are engaged. Um, I'll share another um, question that came from the audience as well, um, which is how does all of this important inform how will this important information be used um, to impact government care uh, for uh, for trans people? Or how should it be? So, what would you know? How would you want um, uh, governments to take action on the um, on the issues you're discussing um, to improve um, uh, uh, to address the impact of the pandemic on trans people? I can s- s- try to start there. Um, we are trying to disseminate this information as widely as possible. Um, and for governments, one thing to consider is how health insurance works. Um, and for, for example, in the US, um, most 
gender affirming care um, is, is not consistently covered by insurance um, and some states cover it, some do not. And so it's kind of hit or miss what people can have access to or have to pay out of pocket for. And also during the pandemic, uh, transition related surgeries were considered uh, cosmetic and non-essential and so were delayed or canceled and that caused a lot of um, problems for trans people. And we have questions about the impacts of delays um, and experiences with delays and cancellations of surgeries in the round two data. So that will be coming up that analysis, but to talk to governments about how transition related care and including surgeries are essential surgeries um, and not not cosmetic, not, uh, not elective uh, for trans people would be a big um, policy change that's needed. Well, as here in Europe, we don't have like self insurance situation, like for example, here in the US, and maybe our data are not really have this impact on like a governmental level, but maybe it, it could and should have an impact on this level for the individual provider. So, of course, we also uh, want to make the data open access and um, spread them around. I think which what is really important is to let our data get to the providers and that providers are aware of the specific situation of trans people in the pandemic and that they have specific needs um, that might differ from needs that uh, uh, of the general population that also lives, lives here in, 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 uh, or, or is also affected by the pandemic. And, that's what we are trying to do. We, as I said, we make our data, we publish it open access and spread it wide around and hope that it could have an impact um, uh, on, on, on uh, especially, or could be important for healthcare providers to have an impact on healthcare. That's it. Really quick, back to the previous question about COVID outcomes. For the round two survey, I just checked, we do have quite a few questions on COVID exposure, experiences with healthcare, testing, et cetera. So we'll have better data on that in the next coming months. Thanks. Another thing that was also just raised, that was also raised um, by participants, and thanks so much, by the way, to all the participants for the really, um, uh, for all the, uh, really thoughtful um, comments and questions was around the issue of um, uh, fees for testing. So the example given that was in Kenya, the cost of a COVID test can range from 50 to $85, obviously uh, a really serious barrier for trans communities that disproportionately experience some poverty. Can you comment on issues of um, sort of user fees and testing fees and whether those are an issue um, in the data you're working with or in the, your context um, and how that's impacting trans people? Well, maybe a few words here from uh, or the perspective from Europe. Uh, there aren't fees for COVID testing here, so this isn't really a problem. Don't know how this works in, in the US. Um, but so this isn't really a barrier. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, so there you can, if you are, you have some cough and fever or something like that, um, you can you call call your your general practitioner and there are some they he tells you or they tell you a time and you get there and get the test and get the result a few days later so it works pretty good around here in europe i don't um don't know how it works in the us maybe will some words yeah in the us um there is you can get testing either through your primary care provider or there are resources set up such that the government is paying for, basically anyone should be able to get a free test, um, but it, it is a little bit more difficult, you know, long lines. Um, I had a trans friend who tried to get tested um, at a drive-through but didn't have a car, <laughs> so was turned away from testing even though they had symptoms. Um, so it is a little bit harder to get free testing, but it's possible. Um, and you know, but the the usual things that would affect trans people affect them there too, in terms of like not having the ID that matches your identity, you know, 
there's not separation of men and women in these lines, luckily, but still it's, you know, the, the extra burden of, of the confusion of the healthcare provider or the fear of going because of the ID not matching. Um, but thankfully, lack of health insurance, which a lot of trans people in places like the US face, should not be an issue with access to COVID testing. Yeah, I can uh, share a little bit about India as well. I think it's similar to uh, what uh, Barbara shared about Kenya, right? The amount uh, ranging from 50 to $85 and very similar situation in India. People are getting COVID, they'll not go for testing. They'll probably um, either isolate themselves or even if, and sometimes they wouldn't even do that, right? Because they have to go out uh, for work, be it uh, any kind of daily age uh, work they're, that, that they're doing. and. Um, yeah, that, that's mostly you know, left to kind of uh, destiny or um, how healthcare has been dealt with. So that's that's uh, pretty much. I, and I think lower uh, middle income companies are the ones uh, which also do not have any kind of data to be able to kind of take that data to the government. And in fact, the government's intervention in, uh, in countries like India, where the population is large, where any one corporation or any one or any top two, three uh, healthcare uh, institutions cannot really solve the challenge, right? If any solutions need to implement, it, it needs to be at a large scale. Um, and hence, uh, you know, the kind of data uh, that, that we can collect here in India and can impact the government decisions uh, is, is at key right now. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to um, recognize that we have a few minutes left before we transition to the next part of the, um, the program. I'm going to give leave everyone a chance to uh, make some uh, final comments. And I think um, in response to a question, we talked a few minutes ago about what government or um, policymakers um, can do uh, to address the impact um, uh, of the pandemic on trans communities. We also have um, healthcare providers in the audience. So I wanted to ask a bit of a different question, which is for people who are um, providers of care, either um, uh, HIV care or, um, or trans care or both, um, what can they be doing um, to address the, um, the impact that the pandemic might be having on, um, on their patients, both in terms of their, their well-being um, and their ability um, to access care? And since it's the last few minutes, if there's anything else you're burning to say, uh, feel free to, to do so as well. Well, from my perspective, I would say uh, healthcare providers, as always, should create a safe space um, for, for trans people and take their special situation in the, in the depend, within the pandemic into account. And I think, uh, it's really important to provide like low threshold opportunities to get to to uh, to get healthcare. For example, via web calls, online consultations, stuff like that. So I think this is, is critical to to ensure uh, high quality healthcare. And thinking what Andrea said, and also just thinking through, you know, who are the most vulnerable, who need the care the most and um, really targeting, you know, people do have to come in physically, think through that, think through that's, you know, the most vulnerable people really lower that threshold to make sure um, trans people get, get the care. Um, one thing I saw a local provider here who does um, a lot of cosmetic surgeries and also she does a lot of trans um, affirming surgeries. Even though everything was shut down as elective, she specifically continued. She shut down all her cosmetic stuff during early in the pandemic and focused exclusively on um, pro providing trans affirming care surgeries. Um, so that was something really great that she did to make sure that, you know, people were still getting their surgeries. And I know other people that got canceled that were able to switch and go to her and continue to get their needs met during the pandemic, which is wonderful. Apart from what Will and Andrea shared, I think I wanted to uh, bring to the fact that in India, the HIV intervention itself is, is, at, is at a good scale right now. And if all these systems and institutions um, can be used uh, as well to talk to people about COVID itself, get, 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 get data back from them on how they're surviving right now, uh, considering there's a good network of uh, local uh, community-based organizations that you know are connected for the HIV 
targeted interventions um, you know and just uh, the last note inviting people to kind of uh, go forward and also consider uh, a lot of uh, covid interventions or covid related research studies to be done in india awesome thank you so much it's been a really um uh, fascinating conversation. I've learned um, a lot about what's happening in different settings. I think we all have. I also want to acknowledge again the um, really um, brilliant um, interventions of the um, participants who have shared comments and asked um, questions. I want to draw people's attention to the fact that at 11:15 um, Eastern, um, or oh, sorry, it's going to be a bit later now. Um, can someone put the, the time information in the chat for me so I can not do the conversion in my head? But after the next talk, there will be a meet the expert session. So what you'll do is you'll go back to the on air um, homepage and click um, the meet the experts of session one um, link, um, at which point you'll have a chance to have a further conversation um, with the presenters in a more informal style where your, um, your voice um, and video will be seen. I also want to acknowledge that we have so many experts um, who are participating. So it's not just experts who are here on screen right now, but um, many experts who are attending as well. So looking forward to being able to have um, more conversation um, with you a bit later um, in the program. Just before that Meet the Expert session, um, we're going to turn uh, shift gears now um, to an overview of epidemiology and drivers of HIV in transgender communities um, being delivered by um, uh, Sari Reisner. And I will share a bit of information about Dr. Reisner. He is Director of Transgender Research in the section of Men's Health, Aging and Metabolism in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Hypertension at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Reisner is also Director of Transgender Health Research at the Fenway Institute at Fenway Health, Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and Assistant Professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's not able to be with us today, as you can imagine by the number of job titles he has. He's a very busy person, um, but we do have um, a talk from him that will help to set the stage for the rest of our um, conversations today. I am here to give an overview of the epidemiology and drivers of HIV in transgender communities. Um, to begin, I would like to um, really start with some basic building blocks of transgender health, and that is uh, really thinking about sex and gender identity. Uh, and when we're referring to sex, we're talking about biological differences that characterize uh, males and females. Uh, typically, this is uh, sex assigned at birth. Uh, usually uh, by a physician or the person uh, who brings a child into the world. Uh, gender identity refers to an internal felt sense of self as female, male, transgender, or some other diverse um, identity. Uh, and sex and gender identity are different. And when we're thinking about um, population surveillance, when we're thinking about HIV surveillance, um, we need to think about um, measuring both of these constructs um, because they do have implications in thinking about the HIV epidemic for transgender people. When we talk about transgender people, we're talking about individuals who have a gender identity that's different than their sex assigned at birth. So this includes people who are transgender, non-binary, or have some other gender diverse identity. Cisgender refers to people who have a gender identity that matches their sex assigned at birth. That is to say, cisgender being on the same side of, whereas transgender being across from. There's a great diversity in the transgender population. Um, a, a, a celebrating diversity is an important piece of thinking about uh, HIV prevention and thinking about the epidemic. And this is because uh, we are looking at gender diversity as a celebration, as a piece that's non-pathologizing. Um, and in the transgender population, we have individuals who identify as transgender women, um, or as trans female, trans girls. Sometimes we talk about people being on a trans feminine spectrum. So these are individuals who are assigned a male sex at birth. We have transgender men who are trans male or trans boys if you're working with adolescents or young people. Trans masculine um, was a spectrum of, of, of transgender men to masculinity. And these are individuals who are assigned a female sex at birth. And then non-binary, 
people who feel like they're outside the traditional female male um, female male gender binary, uh, and this could be people who identify as gender queer or gender fluid, gender expansive. Importantly, there's many different cultural specific identities. So, for example, in India, hijra. Um, in Latin America, we see the identity of travesti. There's many diverse identities. So it's very important to, when we're working in HIV globally, look at the local context um, to really understand the vocabulary and the terminology that's being used. And the important piece here also is that the terminology is always changing and evolving as communities change and evolve. So in order for us to be relevant and most up-to-date, we really need to speak to people who are on the ground. A very key construct in thinking about transgender health and all specifically HIV is gender affirmation. So for transgender people, gender affirmation is very vital and it refers to being recognized or affirms in a person's gender. Typically there's four dimensions to gender affirmation that we talk about, there probably are more, um, but these are the key ones that we talk, talk about. The first is social, and this is really thinking about people's um, pronouns, calling people by the pronoun that they wanna be referred to as, by the name that they wanna be referred to as. And this is also interacting with people, social roles, uh, social expression of gender, gender presentation. So that's a social dimension of affirmation. The psychological dimension of affirmation is really referring to a person's internal felt sense of themselves. It also can um, have be a construct that encompasses, uh, for example, internalized transphobia, the internalization of societal stigma. Um, so that's an important construct in terms of being psychologically affirmed. Medically, we have different medical interventions, um, hormones, surgeries, uh, body modifications. In the case of younger people, for example, adolescents, uh, pubertal blockers. Um, it's very, uh, this can be a very important piece for people in order to align physically um, body with how one feels in one's mind. And then finally, legally. Um, so this is things like name change or gender marker change. You know, it's very important to note that in many places in the world, these are not possible. Legal changes of documents are not possible. And to think about how that non-affirmation impacts daily life as well as specifically access to resources. So for example, testing and having an identification card that's not consistent with what one looks like for HIV testing may be a deterrent for people to get tested. It's also important to note that these constructs don't necessarily all align. In other words, it's not that this is a checklist that people go through in their lives who are transgender. A person can socially affirm their gender and live in their gender. Um, they may not have a desire to medically affirm their gender. Um, there may be people who are non-binary who may medically affirm their gender, but may not live socially in their gender all the time. So there's a diversity of experiences, and this is a very important component of prevention and thinking through the, the factors that we need to consider. Just to be clear, when we're talking about gender identity and transgender people, you know, this is a separate construct, though interrelated, separate construct from sexual orientation. So sexual orientation refers to how a person identifies their physical, romantic, and other emotional attractions to people. And when we look at sexual orientation among transgender people, these are some data um, from the US, what we, see is, uh, uh, what we see is that a high proportion are not identifying as straight or heterosexual. So in this particular sample, 12% uh, are identifying as straight and the rest are not. And this is actually sort of flipped what we would see in the general population where we might see that proportion uh, being uh, straight in the general population would be LGB or, or sexual minority. Um, so we really do have a different distribution within transgender people. And this is very important and also has prevention implications. But transgender people can be of any sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. So in terms of the epidemiology of HIV, we do see global burden of HIV in the world, um, particularly among transgender women, um, with meta-analytics studies suggesting as high as one in five transgender women uh, living with HIV. In this meta-analysis, a 49-fold increased odds among transgender women compared to the, the people of reproductive age in those countries. So we see disparate um, outcomes. We know less about uh, HIV and transgender men. This is certainly an important and nascent area. Um, we do see across studies um, prevalences ranging from zero to 8%, really um, variable across the studies, um, and really the need to have more laboratory confirmed data. 
in terms of sexual risk, we see you know between seven and sixty nine percent fluid exchange in terms of genital genital sexual risk with transgender men. Um, this again is a, a, a very wide range, so it depends on how it's operationalized. Um, and one group that we really are starting to pay more attention to and should continue to do so is transgender MSM. So that is specifically transgender men or trans masculine people who are engaging in sex with cisgender or non-transgender men. This is an important group for prevention efforts. It's an also an important group in terms of an invisible and often underserved population. So we do see, for example, in the US, suboptimal testing rates among transgender women. Uh, for example, 10% in the past tested for the past 12 months compared to cisgender gay and bisexual men, 22%. We also see, for example, in a US context disparities, that is to say among transgender people. Uh, here we see that black and African-American transgender people really bear the burden of new uh, HIV diagnoses in the US. Um, we also have differences um, in age. If we look globally, um, when we see sort of an inflection in the epidemic, uh, where we see uh, young people often in the sort of 20s range and then an inflection in the epidemic uh, increasing uh, with HIV diagnoses thereafter. So HIV acquisition is most often, you know, attributed to condomless sex um, and also needle sharing. Uh, it's important to cons consider that needle sharing uh, for hormones and silicone use um, is something for transgender populations um, that's, that's unique and that we need to pay attention to for prevention efforts. The drivers of HIV risk in transgender people are multi-level. Um, they occur you know, in terms of biologically with anal sex and the high probability of transmiss transmission risk. Um, for transgender men, there can be some risk of vaginal atrophy uh, from hormones, which could cause uh, a more increased transmission. We have network factors, for example, high prevalence of sexual, uh, of HIV rather, high prevalence of HIV in sexual partnership pools. Um, we have high risk environments such as those that are, uh, that are in sex work, which are driven by social and economic factors. We have community factors. We can think about stigma and social exclusion um, as being really key drivers of, of HIV infection for transgender people and HIV risk. And then of course, structural factors. Um, these are the contexts in which these behaviors occur in the larger context. This includes legal protections or lack of legal protections. I mean, these factors all intersect and interact together uh, to increase risk and vulnerability. In addition, transgender people have other health disparities. So HIV is in context of other conditions. Um, these include things like uh, poor self-rated general health, uh, mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, substance use and dependence, high rates of violence and victimization, delays in preventative screenings, so even other preventative screenings in addition to HIV testing, a lack of access to culturally competent care that is gender affirming and meets the needs of transgender people. And then we see a number of social conditions, um, and these really are around the stigma and vulnerabilities. For example, a high proportion uh, unstable housing, poverty, and incarceration rates. Um, and so these all together represent the different health conditions in which HIV is also situated. And so one concept uh, that's helpful is to think about syndemics, which refers to the concentration and deleterious interaction of two or more disease or other health conditions in a population, especially as a consequence of social inequity and the unjust exercise of power. So it's that there are multiple health conditions and that these interact and that where there is one health condition, it's intensified or enhanced, unfortunately, by others in the context of social inequity. And we do see evidence of syndemics operating in transgender populations. I'm gonna show some data from transgender MSM because I did show it, because I did say that it was a group that's under, um, that's under discussed. So uh, we did a study of transgender MSM in Massachusetts in the US, 173 individuals. Um, about 93% identified as sexual minority, about half were on hormones and surgery, about 20% were um, black, indigenous, or people of color. And we looked at six indicators that we summed for syndemic, binge drinking, substance use, depression, anxiety, childhood abuse, and intimate partner violence. And what we found was that syndemics were associated with increased odds of condomless sex at the last sex that they had with a cisgender male, and that social gender affiliation moderated syndemics. So in this sample, trans MSM who had socially affirmed their gender 
but not those had not had increased risk of syndemics being associated with condomless sex. So in other words, what we found in this study is that for trans MSM, those syndemic pathways, which we have seen in research uh, with cisgender MSM, that those syndemic pathways may be operating similarly, but that there really is a need to integrate the syndemics and gender affirmation frameworks for MSM, for trans MSM. Similarly, gender non-affirmation itself from cis male partners may be a unique risk factor. So in transgender populations, it's important to consider general risk factors that we might see in other populations, key populations, but also consider the specificity of vulnerabilities. So in another sample of 857 trans MSM that we sampled online in the US, 65% were less than age 30 years old, 28% were non-binary identified in their gender, 33% identified as gay, 70% 70, 70 were white and Latinx, majority were on hormones and had had surgery. And what we found is a scale that we made about gender non-affirmation. Some of the items, for example, on the right were, I have been mispronounced or misgendered during sex. Um, I have crossed boundaries to validate my gender identity or expression in the sexual encounter. And we found that 78% of the 857 trans MSM reported gender non-affirmation in the last six months. Gender affirmation was associated, not gender non-affirmation, excuse me, was associated with higher psychological distress and anxiety, as well as lower odds of HIV testing and higher odds of past six month condomless receptive sex. So this need to consider gender non-affirmation and how that may drive HIV risk behaviors. In this sample, we looked specifically also at 843 uh, HIV negative MSM uh, that were within the sample. And one of the things to think about is pre-exposure prophylaxis and the uptake of PrEP and other biomedical prevention strategies in trans communities. Uh, in this sample, 84% have heard of PrEP. Um, of these, uh, about one third reported lifetime PrEP use. 55% uh, overall were PrEP indicated. I'm showing you on the right a, a schema uh, that is through the any PrEP indication as defined by the Centers for Disease Control um, in the US. And one of the issues is also how do we measure PrEP indication in transgender populations? Um, what are the metrics? Do we use heterosexual PrEP indication? Do we use MSM PrEP indication? Um, so in this, we combined a measure of multiple uh, different indications, and we found that about half, 55.2% were PrEP indicated, and that factors that associated with PrEP indication were being gay identified versus not, psychological distress, hazardous alcohol use, and poly drug use, so some mental health variables, higher perceived HIV risk, which we've seen in other populations, and also a unique impact of stigma, bias as gender male sex partners, so using that scale from the prior slide. So in summary, when we look at the HIV epidemic and drivers in transgender and gender diverse populations, what we see is a high burden of HIV disease. We see a vulnerable population in need of resources for prevention and care. We see that drivers of vulnerability occur at multiple different levels, ranging from the individual sort of biological level to the community and structural levels. We see how syndemics and other health disparities co-occur. And we see how these also influence the pathways of the HIV epidemic. It's also important when we look at transgender HIV that we think about gender affirmation and the key role that this plays uh, in the epidemic and the specificity of transgender experiences. And finally, it's critical that we engage transgender and gender diverse communities. Without doing so, we won't understand even the basic terminology and we won't be able to really identify the true um, engagement that we need for transgender people. And so when we think about the, the HIV prevention strategies, we do need combination prevention interventions. And this ultimately will be the way that we can address the HIV epidemic among transgender people. Using a participatory population perspective, we can work with and not on transgender communities and doing so will enable us to really be able to tailor the combination approaches um, for this specific population. Thank you very much. Here's my contact information. So please feel free to reach out. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Eisner, for a really um, uh, informative talk that sets us up really well for the conversations that will be taking place um, for the next little while today, as well as tomorrow. Um, later this afternoon, there's going to be a session focusing on um, uh, hormones and antiretrovirals, both for um, treatment and prevention of HIV. 
But now, as I mentioned before, we have a meet the expert session. So that's half an hour um, to speak with the, um, the three panelists from this morning. And to access um, the meet the experts, what you need to do is go back to your timeline in the top left corner of your screen and click uh, to join the Meet the Experts Session 1 um, session. So we will see you there in a moment. Thank you. <laughs> 